<laughs> Still fights itself, let's see. Drift mode ESC off, that's the answer. Hey crew, I've got the key to that 23 Volkswagen Golf R. And we are gonna take it for a drive, I'm sorry. I had to, but first, let's check it out looks on the inside and outside. The only styling changes for the 23 model year come with the 20th anniversary edition that brings like special badges and puddle lamps. We don't have that. So the standard Golf R gets an R logo beneath a blue accent and illuminated light bar connecting the LED matrix headlights with LED DRLs and turn signals. Those are above gloss black pieces with functional ventilation. And these little winglets here look like it's feeding the mouth when you take a look at the front. This one is painted in lapis blue metallic and the color really pops in the sunlight here on a cloudy day. Still looks good. At the side, the Golf R gets a set of 19 inch machined alloy wheels and a two-tone finish wrapped in Bridgestone summer performance tires, 235 section front and rear. Within those wheels are upgraded brakes, drilled and slotted rotors, sized 14.1 inch front, 12.3 inch at the rear, clamped on by these blue painted brake calipers. More R logos on the side, matte silver mirror caps, and stepping back to look at the profile, it's a shape we are very familiar with at this point. And I love the classic proportions. I like the extended rear spoiler at the back as well, helping distinguish the R from the GTI. LED tail lights are here with LED turn signals. There's another R logo in the center. You get a gloss black diffuser and four chrome exhaust outlets. Considering what Volkswagen is clearly going for with this vehicle, a more mature contrast to the boy racery hot hatchbacks, this is a 10 out of 10 for me. It looks premium while still having the spicy details. My question for you, is the design too modest for the performance? Let me know in the comments and let's check out the interior. Opening up and looking inside at this black leather interior with blue leather accents around the headrests and this carbon fiber style weave thing around the seat borders. The rear seats are heated as standard and there are blue details on the carpeted floor mats on the doors. Hard plastics up high. You do get leatherette padding here for the insert and armrest. One touch up down windows, more hard plastics down low and a standard Harman Kardon sound system. Stepping in behind my own seat at six feet tall. The knees have some breathing room. There are pockets here, perfect for your smartphone. And this, what we still call the map pocket, but no one uses maps anymore, is good for stuff. The foot pockets are good size to slide my feet under. Thigh support is kind of just okay though. Headroom is good. Head clears the roof by a lot. That gets the thumbs up from me. There are air vents in the middle, plus a third zone of climate control with two USB-C ports down low. The drive shaft dump is big, but not insurmountable. And while I wouldn't necessarily recommend this for a long haul, you could fit three full-size adults in the second row, maybe just to get around the corner for lunch with your coworkers. If you don't have a middle passenger, then there's an armrest that comes down with leather padding and two cup holders plus a espresso holder. Not really sure what that is. Let's check out the front. Door closed noise. Sounds well built. The front two doors have smart keyless entry. The front seats are more heavily bolstered than the backs with these blue accents and that carbon fiber styling coming up the side. Our logos on the seat backs, perforated seat centers. The front seats are both heated and ventilated as standard. The driver's seat gets multi-way power adjustments and three position memory. The passenger seat gets a hybrid setup of manual and power adjustments. And both of those are beneath a standard power sunroof. The foot pedals have aluminum accents and you'll notice this car has three pedals because we've got the manual gearbox. The front doors look similar to the back, but this piece is injection molded now. There's more carbon fiber styling here. This is definitely not carbon fiber trim and it's not textured. There are power adjusting, not power folding door mirrors. No release for the hatch from up here. Instead, we come to the back 
put our hand at the top of the VW logo, then pull from the bottom to reveal just under 20 cubic feet of space behind the second row, which does fold down 60-40. You can reach the tabs from back here, but it's easier if you remove the cargo cover. They do fold almost completely flat, giving you just under 35 cubic feet of space. To close the hatch, there's no formal handle to pull. Instead, this icon indicates you put your hand here and you pull towards you. What do you know? It works every single time. Hopping in the driver's seat. We find a leather wrap steering wheel with perforations at nine and three and great sport grips for your hands to slot into. Little flat bottom design going on. Touch sensitive controls on the wheel. These work pretty well, but then it gets very smudgy with fingerprints. Driving aids are on the left. On the right, we find reconfigurations for your digital gauge cluster with quite a few different views to choose from and further customizations of what's going on the left and right hand sides of the screen. Head up display, injection molding up on the dashboard, more of that fake carbon fiber trim. 10 inch touchscreen infotainment system has nice graphics and it's pretty responsive, but the menu structure can be irritating. For example, if I want to adjust the stability control, I have to go to vehicle, swipe right, hit brakes, hit brakes, then hit the drop down and then choose what I want. Way too many steps. There's no volume knob either. So you just have this slider, which is imprecise while driving. You can't just do incremental adjustments. It's just not as intuitive as a knob. Same thing with climate control. It's a slider or you tap up or down. The problem with this is that I'm constantly hitting the volume when I'm just resting my hand here to operate the infotainment system. This needs a rethink. I need a, I need a physical home button as well. It does have wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Beneath the screen are additional icons for things like drive modes. Two USB-C ports are hidden under here. There's a wireless charging pad. Lots of gloss black trim, which just collects dust like a magnet. Leather wrap shift boot with blue stitching. Leather wrapping on the back side of the shifter with a plastic topper. Then we've got two cup holders. This one can clamp onto your bottle. There's a DC outlet. Leather topping with blue accenting for your adjusting armrest slash console lid with just a bit of storage inside. Visibility is excellent. And there's standard blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic. This cabin is very feature rich for the money and quite upscale looking, but the technology here and some of the trim materials are a bit of a bummer. Now let's take the Golf R manual for a drive. All right, let's fire it up. Get a little rumble from the turbo for its startup, but it, it keeps it modest. And once the infotainment system is good to go, we can select our drive mode. Come on. Come on. I'm not going to cut any of this. I want you to see how long it takes. All right, now we're good. I'm going to go into comfort. I'm going to go into comfort. There we are. And down goes the e-brake to go into reverse. Press down on the gear selector over and up to the left. That brings up a high resolution camera system. And you've got another angle here. The ultra wide view. I love this view. You can see what's going on around you. into first and we will begin with a turning radius test wheel fully cranked it's pretty good for an all-wheel drive vehicle the wheelbase isn't terribly long turn signal sound it's a little loud I don't mind the tone at all though and the world-famous horn test Ooh, what in the name? It was so loud inside the cabin and really high pitched. Didn't like that at all. Moving on to the powertrain. We have a 2.0 liter turbocharged four cylinder under the hood that makes 315 horsepower. And depending on your gearbox choice, you either with a six speed manual make 280 pound feet of torque or with a seven speed dual clutch, you make 295 pound feet. But whichever gearbox you choose, that power is routed to all four tires via a variable all-wheel drive system. 
And with peak torque coming in from just 1900 RPM, it doesn't matter that we're in the comfort drive mode. The boost is right there when you need it to get up to speed. And let's talk about this transmission for a second because I have some qualms with it. First, the shifter. It's a very bizarre shape. Like if I wanted to shift always with my hand on top of it, then it's a nice flat surface, but I don't shift like that. I shift with my hand around the shifter. And so therefore the shape of this not being something more traditional like a, like a cue ball or even the cylinder that you get in the Civic Type R is a bit bizarre to hold. I, I can't say I like that. The actual gearbox itself, well, the clutch has a long pedal travel and the friction point is very communicative, but the release point is less so. I found myself, at least the first couple days driving this, just not sure whether I'd actually engaged the gear and I was clear to release the clutch pedal fully. And so there was a bit of bucking that was happening there. Uh, the gearbox, the throws, are longer and looser than I would like. The notch into each gear is a nice clink or click. It's a nice click into each gear, and so that part is enough communication for me. But the throws themselves, I gotta I gotta swim a long ways before I actually get to the notch for the gear. The ride quality, though, gets a whole lot of praise from me. This adaptive damper setup doles the impacts of harsh road imperfections very, very well, especially for this price point and especially for the sporty intentions of the Golf R. This is very daily drivable. The seats are extra comfortable. I had a two and a half hour stint behind the wheel driving from here to Palm Springs and I was no less fatigued from the start to the end of my journey. And as the speeds pick up now here on the highway, listening for the NVH level. What most clearly comes through into the cabin is the wind noise a brush against the seams and the tire noise. There's a constant hum there. Neither are at a level that's anywhere close to intolerable. And when I think about the Golf R compared to the Civic Type R or the GR Corolla, it's still quieter in here. And so that gels well with the exterior presentation of modesty. That's, that's the level inside the cabin as well. We also have features like adaptive cruise control with steering assistance, even if you get the six-speed manual. And these are really great features to have. And while I'm thinking of it, this is a great time to mention that I did review the Golf R with the dual clutch. If you haven't seen that video, I'll make sure there's a card here for you to go check out. My conclusion is that the Golf R is the best commuter of its hot hatch competitors, but is it the best instrument for attacking a canyon road? Let's find that out next. Now, before things get heated, let's look at our drive mode options. To access those, you hit the mode button there or for the fun ones, hit the R button on the wheel. That will change up the gauge cluster, put you in race mode, and give you these selections. You can have drift mode, which will distribute more of the torque to the rear axle. You can send up to 50% of available torque there, or go into special, stiffens up the suspension, adds weight to the steering, and let's just hear it. Opens up the baffles and the active exhaust, or you can go into custom, which is a reconfigurable mode, customize each of these settings, including the engine sound, steering, and throttle response, we are going to go into the special mode to kick things off. Well, one of the first things I noticed is the additional weight of the steering, but it's not just heavier, it loads up perfectly in the corners to communicate the grip which is quite sufficient with the all-wheel drive system. The turn-in is immediate. The 
brakes have good bite to them and with the stiffened suspension the body stays nice and flat through the corners still not loving this gearbox here especially now in a sportier application I want shorter throws this feels like hate to say it but an economy gearbox Otherwise, this is really fun to drive this car. I'm not really feeling the absence of the 15 pound feet of torque compared to the dual clutch version of the Golf R. It's got plenty of poke out of corners. The ELSD up front can distribute that torque very well. And there's no torque steer anymore. It's a variable ELSD. So it's not just all the power to the tire with grip. It kind of feeds it gently. So I don't have the yanking of the steering wheel when I go full throttle. The overwhelming sensation here is just one of smoothness. Golf R is very in control of itself. And asked to be pushed harder. I like hearing more of that Turbo 4 as well. The note isn't one of complaint. of feistiness. You know what I would really appreciate is the option for rev matching. I thought about this in traffic, thinking about how, man, if there was a way for it to auto blip the throttle and rev match those shifts, I wouldn't need to do that when just moseying around. And here, in a canyon environment, I would like the option to turn it off to practice the blipping of the throttle myself, the heel-toe shifting. But it would be nice if it was available if I wanted it on. You don't get that. You just, you're doing it yourself. Getting back to some praise for the Golf R, the neutral handling. It does not feel like it's really desiring to plow the nose. It'll do it if you misuse the car in a corner, if you just crank the wheel and map the throttle and hope that it'll sort itself out with neutral handling, it's not gonna work that way. But if you work around it, if you do a bit of trail braking, or if you can just gently massage your way through the curve, then you can rely on the torque vectoring system in the back to distribute up to 100% of the 50% max available torque side to side. So we'll bring the back end around as you lay in the throttle to help you exit the curve with the right amount of rotation. <laughs> yeah, you could have fun. You could have a lot of fun behind the wheel. And to return to the rev match feature, or lack the rev for just a moment, at least since you're having to rev match yourself, the pedal placement is right for you to easily drag your right foot over, not bring it fully off the brake to get that heel, blip the throttle, and match those revs in a not uncomfortable way. Moving on to a demonstration of real-world 0-60 performance in the Golf R manual. I've got my race box set up here, and stability control is in sport because when I had it fully on, it was robbing power with every gear change. So into first, revving it out. And 
they're 60 in 5.66 seconds. Now, could the launch have been done more perfectly? Yes. Could the shifts have been a little cleaner? Sure. But that's kind of the point of a real world zero to 60 test. You're not always gonna get the perfect launch. You're not always gonna get every shift just right. Independent tests who have flogged a Golf R manual again and again on a test track to get the quickest time have seen the very high, like 4.9 seconds or very low fives. With the dual clutch, you're consistently seeing pretty much like 4.6 seconds across the board. Not only is that dual clutch more consistent to launch the Golf R, but it also gets that extra 15 pound feet of torque to get you there quicker. And those aren't the real reasons why I would actually choose the dual clutch over this manual. It's because this gearbox is such a humdrum affair. It feels like an afterthought. And so while I'm a big advocate for more manuals in good performance vehicles, I want them to be engineered properly, not just the lackluster effort that I feel from this. It's not like the manual transmission ruins the driving experience in this car. It's just unlike so many other vehicles equipped with manuals, it doesn't add to the experience. It doesn't make it more fun. And that is a bummer, isn't it? And that's gonna lead me to my miles per hour word of the day, which for the 23 Golf R manual specifically is stoic, meaning enduring hardship without complaining or sometimes even emotion. Because you could really beat on this car in a corner, in a straight line, and it'll just take it. It'll give you what you're looking for for the most part. But if what you're looking for is a little bit more excitement and feeling, then you're gonna find yourself desiring something like the Civic Type R or like that Toyota GR Corolla. Still a smile on my face though. And let's see if we can't turn that smile into something more with drift mode. Activating it here, that's gonna put the stability control in sport, which it actually already was before this. And first we'll try it like this before we fully switch it off to see if the system knows what it's doing. Just kind of hand fisting it, not expecting a whole lot from this front wheel drive biased all wheel drive system. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, at a certain point, it just wants to cut the power because it's not rear-wheel drive. But okay, that's like that. Now let's try turning off this system. Way too many steps once again. All right, ESC is fully off now. Let's give this a shot now. <laughs> Still fights itself, let's see. Drift mode, ESC off. That's the answer. That is the answer right there, folks. Yes! Drift mode gets the giggles out of me while still, honestly, still having this impression of stoicism to the Golf Bar, unlike for example, the Ford Focus RS, which also had like a drift mode, but its all wheel drive system could send more than 50% of the torque to the rear tire. So while the Golf R can shuttle 100% of the available 50% to just one tire and kind of overdrive the outside wheel, it doesn't do so with the same potential rear drive oversteer fun as the Focus RS. It's, it's just a stoic version of drift mode. Now, before we get into competition more firmly, let's talk about the fuel economy, top speed, and price point for the Golf R. The fuel economy is 20 MPG in the city, 28 on the highway, and 23 combined for the six-speed manual. 
the top speed is limited to 155 miles per hour. And the starting figure for the Golf R manual is just under $46,000. Competitors include two vehicles I've already mentioned, the Toyota GR Corolla, which starts at just under $37,000 for the core version, but honestly, the only version of that you really want has the front and rear torsen and limited slip differentials. The price point is really closer to $39,000 or $40,000 for it. It makes 300 horsepower on the nose, gets to 60 in 4.9 seconds, has a top speed of 143 miles per hour, fuel economy of 24 combined, and a bit less cargo space than the Golf R. The Honda Civic Type R, the new FL5 generation, starts just under $44,000, makes 315 horsepower, gets to 60 in 4.9 seconds, has a top speed of 169 miles per hour, fuel economy of 24 combined, and a little more cargo space than the Golf R. So that means this vehicle is the most expensive to start, but in exchange, you get the most comely exterior design, the most upscale interior, and unequivocally, the best ride quality. This is really the vehicle that makes the most sense logically. It's the one you're gonna to wanna to look at every single day and drive in the greatest variety of environments. But logic is boring, isn't it? And I think that the Golf R, even with the dual clutch, which is the transmission I would choose for this vehicle, is not the way I'd go about it. If I had the big kid in me, which never really goes away, then I'm gonna choose either the very precise but engaging Honda Civic Type R or the just hooligan, raucous Toyota GR Corolla. But which would you choose? Let me know in the comments, would you go Volkswagen Golf R and would you have it with the manual or would you go dual clutch automatic for that one? Or would you have the Toyota GR Corolla or would you have the Honda Civic Type R? I hope you've enjoyed this POV drive review. If you did, please like, comment, and share it. Subscribe to the channel, hit that bell to get notified, and I will see you again next time.